Hello and a very warm welcome to this video. Thank you for joining in the fun of it. You're looking at an engraving of the great poet and playwright Ben Jonson. Now, I've called this presentation Abraham Holland New, fully aware, of course, that it's not what you might call a clickbait title, but it is part of an ongoing series of similar titles, So and So New, in each of which I take the testimony of a contemporary of William Shakespeare's and show that that person knew that William Shakespeare was a pseudonym being used by the poetical Earl of Oxford, Edward de Vere. If you haven't seen some, all or any of these, I do urge you please to do so, because it is, of course, through corroboration that we finally prove the matter. Now, going back to this engraving, you can see that it is by Robert Vaughan, and I'll have more to say about him in a future presentation. For the moment, I would like to look at the verses by Abraham Holland, and these are praising that picture of Ben Jonson's. Actually praising Ben Jonson. I'm particularly interested in this line, sorry it's in Latin, Vindex ingeni recen sepulti, which means that Jonson is a recent vindicator of buried genius. He is of course referring to Jonson's publication of the first folio of William Shakespeare, the 1623 great big folio of 36 plays. Interesting that he's putting it like this, the suggestion that Shakespeare needed a vindicating that his genius was somehow buried. Doesn't make a lot of sense to the Stratfordians, but it does make an enormous sense, of course, to Oxfordians, who are fully aware that the Earl of Oxford was in some sort of disgrace in the last decade of his life, that he was excluded from the court, that he had gone practically bankrupt, and that he was embroiled in a personal scandal relating to the paternity of his son, Henry Vere, 18th Earl of Oxford. I will give you a translation of all the Latin words here. Behold the image of Johnson, sacred high priest of the divine inspiration of the muses, a recent vindicator of buried genius, the only restorer of ancient art, father of past learning and bold renewer of ancient drama. The only man this figure resembles is in life no less fortunate, no less refined. Oh, could there be an art found out that might produce his shape so lively as to write? So we can clearly establish from this that Abraham Holland, who was a poet in London at the time, a contemporary of Ben Jonson, was hugely admiring Ben Jonson, and of all those things that he admires him for, he pulls out his treatment, his vindication, his redemption, if you like, of the buried genius of Shakespeare. That is very important to Abraham Holland in his description of Johnson. So I'd like you please to bear that in mind as we look at what I really want to look at today, which is another poem by Abraham Holland, and it is entitled An Elegy Upon the Death of the Right Noble and Magnanimous Hero Henry, Earl of Oxford, Viscount Bulbick, Lord Samford and Lord Great Chamberlain of England, who sickened in service of his king and country in defence of the states and died at the Hague in Holland, April 1625. This is printed in 1626, so it's an elegy to the 18th Earl of Oxford, and one has a very good reason to assume that if Abraham Holland took the trouble to write a great elegy to the 18th Earl of Oxford, he actually knew him, and he certainly knew quite a lot about him. The 18th Earl of Oxford was something of a reprobate in his youth. He was about seven years old when uh, Shakespeare, the poetical Earl of Oxford, died. He didn't get on at all well with his mother, who, as I've shown elsewhere, was not actually his mother anyway, but he may or may not have known that. And he left England shortly after her death in 1613 and spent uh, most of his 20s in Italy. He then returned and he became a soldier and he uh, married late in life an heiress, a very beautiful woman, who was the great-granddaughter of William Cecil, Lord Burley, but he had no children by her, and he died aged 32 of a fever in The Hague following a, a shot to the arm at the Siege of Breda. Now let's have a look what Abraham Holland has to say about him. We particularly want to look at the first paragraph of this poem. Notice the title, An Elegy Upon the Death of the Right Noble and Magnanimous Henry Earl of Oxford, Viscount Bulbeck and Co. And that title is 18 words long because he's describing the 18th Earl of Oxford. Remember how important numbers are to poets in these days. 
fact, verses are called numbers very often. And this 18-word title rather brings to mind, does it not, Ben Jonson, so much admired by Abraham Holland for his treatment of Shakespeare and his famous encomium to Shakespeare in the 1623 first folio, to the memory of my beloved the author, Mr. William Shakespeare, and what he hath left us, which is 17 words long, 17, because he is describing the 17th Earl of Oxford. Now, if we look at this poem by Abraham Holland, we notice something rather bizarre. He describes the 18th Earl of Oxford, recently died, as a star. And in the very next line, he compares him to a constellation. This is a weird thing to do because a constellation, as we all know, is a group of stars. And you can't be a group of stars and a singular star at the same time, can you? Well, this, some of you may remember, has only ever happened once before, as far as I am able to ascertain. And this is in Ben Jonson's poem to William Shakespeare, in which he describes him in the last six lines as a constellation, and in the very next line, as a star. Is it possible, then, that Abraham Holland is deliberately referring to the last six lines of Ben Jonson's poem to Shakespeare here? Let's see what he says about this star. He says, like a comet's rage, he strikes he amazement on the trembling age. So he's comparing... Henry Vere is this bright comet up in the up in the sky, striking amazement on the trembling age. And what does Ben Jonson say about Shakespeare? He calls him a star who with rage or influence chide or cheer the drooping stage. So we have the comet's rage, striking amazement on the trembling age on the right, and on the left we have the star who with rage is chiding the drooping stage. Remember that stage is, of course, a metaphor for the age. So those two lines are saying tantamount the same thing, using the same rhyming pattern. And it becomes clear then that Abraham Holland is actually alluding to the Shakespeare poem, to the last six lines of Ben Jonson. Now, I hope that many of you, if not all of you, will have seen a presentation I put online a short while ago called Kepler's Supernova Explodes the Stratfordian Myth, in which I examine these last six lines of Ben Jonson, and I show that when Ben Jonson calls Shakespeare a star, he is not talking about any old star. He is specifically referring to a very bright star that appeared in the night sky in October 1604, called Kepler's Supernova. Had a huge effect on intellectuals of the time because it's very unusual for a star to appear in the night sky. That is the star he is referring to. And we know this because we can look carefully at the description of the star as he lays it out in his tribute to Shakespeare. And we can see that it has to be a star that could criticize and influence the world uh, that was visible both night and day, very rare thing for a star, and most importantly that it is a star that first appeared after Shakespeare's death. And we know that there was no star that appeared in the night sky, very rare thing indeed for a star to appear in the night sky. Usually the stars are fixed, everyone used to think they were fixed, um, but to have a star that appeared after Stratford Shakespeare's death in 1616 in time for Ben Jonson to talk about in 1623, was not possible. The only star that had appeared in the night sky for the first time in Ben Jonson's knowledge but before 1623 was this Kepler's supernova of 1604. If you want to know more about this, have a look, as I say, at Kepler's supernova explodes the Stratfordian myth. I have put a link to it with the description of this video. Now, in that presentation, I did not tell you something about the Kepler supernova that is relevant to what we are looking at now. It appeared, as I said, in October 1604, but it was only visible to the naked eye for about 18 months. It slowly dimmed and eventually disappeared. So by the time Abraham Holland was writing this to Henry Vere, the Earl of Oxford, it was no longer visible. It had dimmed to nothing. Now let's have a look at the opening lines of this paragraph. 
Watt with that great double V for De Vere, we know about that. What star was wanting in the sky? What place to be supplied anew? What empty space that required Oxford? Was some light grown dim, some star decrepit that suborned him to dark the earth by his departure? He is asking what star has disappeared in the night sky that requires to be supplied anew by Oxford. So I think it is absolutely plain as a pike star from those opening lines that he is talking about Kepler's supernova and he is relating us directly to the last six lines of Ben Jonson's poem, which describes Shakespeare as the supernova that appeared in the night sky in October 1604. And by the time that Abraham Holland was writing about the next Earl of Oxford, it had dimmed and had disappeared. That, I would say, is very strong evidence that Abraham Holland knew that the 18th Earl of Oxford had received his honours from the 17th Earl of Oxford, who was William Shakespeare. Now, just a couple of small points of interest to be found in the rest of the poem. We are told that Henry Vere, 18th Earl of Oxford, is not particularly keen on the theatre, unlike his poetical father. To see a mask and sit it out, he held a greater task than to endure a siege. Well, that's a pretty odd thing to say, given that the 18th Earl of Oxford actually died from wounds at the Siege of Breda. So he really must have hated going to see a mask. A mask, of course, is a staged performance of poetry. And I think this gives us a sense that uh, he wasn't literate or cultured. Particularly odd in this context, because only a few lines before, we're told what will happen when he arrives in heaven. Those British ghosts, which long ago were numbered in the Elysian throng, joy to behold him. Sidney, the only ghost, by the way, who is mentioned, Sidney threw his bays on Oxford's head and deigned to sing his praise, while fame with silver trumpet did keep time with his high voice and answer it his rhyme. So I think we can be pretty sure, given that Oxford, the 18th Earl of Oxford, couldn't bear to go to a mask, didn't like poetry, that who's being referred to here actually is not the 18th Earl of Oxford, but the 17th Earl of Oxford, who is being crowned uh, in heaven by Sidney with his bays, his poetical bays, pretty obviously. And we can tell that we, this is a passing reference to the 17th Earl of Oxford, because it follows on from what is said about the 18th Earl of Oxford's so-called ancestors. Remember that he's not, strictly speaking, the legitimate son of the 17th Earl of Oxford. And I think this comes out in this sentence about the 18th Earl of Oxford arriving in heaven, nor came he to the Elysium with shame that the old Veers did blush to hear his name brighter than theirs, almost as a parenthesis after that. Why would the old Veers, all his ancestors in heaven, why would they possibly blush to hear his name. Well, we all know the reason for that is because, strictly speaking, he shouldn't be calling himself the Earl of Oxford if he is not the legitimate son of the 17th Earl of Oxford. Now, remember that this poem is by Abraham Holland, and it looks a little bit from this line as though Abraham Holland is aware of the paternity issue concerning the 18th Earl of Oxford, just as his brother was. Here is a, an engraving uh, by Compton Holland, or at least to be sold, published by Compton Holland, Abraham Holland's brother. And you'll notice the RV at the bottom. That's Robert Vaughan, the same engraver who did the Ben Jonson engraving with Abraham Holland's verses beneath it. And the next instalment, I'm going to talk about this very extraordinary engraving of Henry 18th Earl of Oxford and asked the question, did Compton Holland know something about the paternity of the 18th Earl of Oxford that he wished to convey in this extraordinary engraving? I hope if you want to see this that you will be subscribed to this channel and you will have pressed the bell button to get an announcement when anything new is uploaded. The next presentation will be about this very extraordinary engraving, and I hope you will join me to discover all about it. Thank you so much for watching.